It's Wormception, baby. No, but like seriously, so many worms, they are out of control. Hello, Internet. I'm Ren, and I want to talk about Futurama Season 11, Episode 4, Parasites Regained. I'll give some spoiler-free thoughts before I give you a warning, and we shrink down to explore the litter full of spoilers. Eh? No? I was really excited for this episode because Parasites Lost is one of my favorite early Futurama episodes. I mean, the holophoner sequence is still one of my favorite bits in the entire show. Following that episode up was a tall order, and unfortunately, I think it doesn't quite hit the mark when compared. But I think it's my favorite of the first four episodes this season, and it definitely has some sweet, funny, and heartwarming moments going for it. The episode is also a vehicle for a Dune parody that works pretty well. I enjoyed the world that they created for the characters to explore. It's a Nibbler episode, but I can't help but feel that I second that emotion did Nibbler in peril a bit better, and The Day the Earth Stood Stupid and The Why of Fry did a better job expanding the lore around the Nibblonians and Nibbler as a character. With this episode, the initial setup was better than the past three episodes, and the story felt like it flowed more. I think it benefited from a storyline that mostly just focuses on one plot rather than a lot of smaller subplots. But it's hindered by setting itself up for some disappointment by drawing influences from such exceptional and iconic episodes, while also feeling a smidge contrived, which is particularly noticeable because the episode is associating itself with stories that were so much better established within the larger narrative. It was a really good effort that's mostly effective. It just doesn't quite hit the highest highs of some of these other episodes. But that is all I can really say without spoilers, so let's get into it. This video contains spoilers for Futurama so far, and especially for Parasites Regained, which I will be spoiling in detail. We start with Leela at a dog park with Nibbler, who eats some guy's dog, and then some guy. I think this might be the first time we've seen Nibbler eat an entire human person, as far as I can recall, so that's pretty wild. Side note, I love that we see Fluffers with her tiny pet human Dave Spiegel from the vet's office in I Second That Emotion and the pet show in The Day the Earth Stood Stupid. That's a nice little callback. Nibbler runs to his litter box to drop some dark matter. Leela rediscovers that Nibbler can talk. Who wants to see the new alien language movie by Bax Gligliff? I'd like to see the film, Leela. Nibbler, you can talk! You always forget I can talk. And they take in a foreign film together. They dish about it at the same little cafe Leela and Fry visit in Parasites Lost. A cute detail for sure. At Leela's apartment, they do a cubic crossword together. Nibbler's sick and Leela takes him to the vet. He's got worms that are making him lose his mind. The vet gives Leela ivermectin for Nibbler. Fortunately, there's a cure. What is it? Sorry. Ivermectin. The vet's a beleaguered little guy who has had it with being interrupted. If you're done interrupting, we're finished. Thank you. I wasn't. Nibbler takes his pills in cheese. Maybe Gouda for a nice brie. <laughs> like a dog. But his cheese requests get less sophisticated as he continues to decline. Make it American in individual plastic wrapped slices. No! The medicine just isn't working. The professor reveals that Nibbler is getting reinfected from his litter box every time he uses it. Ew. The crew's gotta shrink down to fight the worms and save Nibbler. They load up into a toy tank and get small. I love the little racetrack Farnsworth sends them down like a matchbox car. It's adorable. What we get next is a Dune-inspired sequence in Nibbler's litter box with glittering litter dust as a substitute for spice. The tank immediately sinks in the sand, so the crew is on their own. Zoidberg gets high on the litter glitter and foretells the coming of the Dune. G Beatles. We get several to many Dune references here. Hang on a sec. I'm taking a whiz. At least one of you has manners. I thank you for your gift of moisture. No. The Beatles are seeking a messiah. Ancient prophecy speaks of a messiah. Could he be the Quiznos Cadillac? Nope. The gang follows them to their castle, and the beetles are also in conflict with the sandworms. The shaman dune beetle uses a special chamber to show them the way to the worms and sends a guide along with them. Listen to him closely and do most of what he says. There's a little visual gag I love where she gets the munchies and eats a jar of frosting labeled Betty Cockroach. We get to enjoy some of the horrors of the litter desert, including the pus fungus and skin pigeon. 
and also these tiny little crab guys. The guy totally gets sandwormed because of course he does. Don't worry about me. Our best guy taught me everything. He and the gang falls over a cliff and gets high on glitter before a sandstorm hits. Bender tap dances to summon the worms. The big worm appears, and it turns out it is actually the smaller worms that infested Fry and Parasites lost. That arguably makes the death of the guide way more horrifying. Leela starts blasting, and everyone else joins in, until a glittered nibbler shrinks down and intervenes. Stop! Stop fighting! The Doom Beetles show up and recognize Nibbler as the Messiah. As pictured in the ancient scripture, it shows him with blonde hair and blue eyes, but the rest is spot on. He tells them that all life is connected, and he basically wants to just submit to the ecosystem. Please leave these worms to play their part, and I, I will happily play mine. Even if it means sacrificing all that I am and becoming a mindless house pet. Leela is very emotional at the prospect of Nibbler succumbing to the worms despite his wishes. She decides to go back into the box and try and understand his decision, and she convinces the Doom Beetles to let her use the chamber. Nope. Pure, uncut glitter is dangerous. You could end up permanently tasting colors or smelling sounds. I can smell sound. Fry singing stinks up the whole apartment. With some help from Fry. Yeah, and if you don't let Leela use the chamber, I'm gonna stink up this whole place. I feel a song coming on! <laughs> she sees the web of life in the chamber, but also that the worms are infested with parasites themselves, and that's why they aren't making Nibbler smarter like they're supposed to. Everyone has a stomping party to destroy the sub-parasites, and also Zoidberg. Sorry! I can't hear your screams over the tapping! <laughs> Is he dead, or... Leela might have some lingering effects from the glitter, but it's worth it because Nibbler is back to normal. Nibbler checks in with his planet, and we close out with him getting a snuggle from Leela as they do the crossword. You're my little fuzzler. I remember. This does beg the question whether his species is only intelligent because of the influence of the parasitic worms. So that is kind of an interesting little bit of lore but that just raises further questions. All in all, it was a cute episode. I liked the desert they created in Nibbler's litter box, and I enjoyed the Doom Beetles. I thought it was fun that they referred to a map of the box as a map of the universe. Behold, a map of the universe. Kind of like the statue of Fry erected by the worms in Parasites Lost. <gasps> I'm what I would say is an extremely casual Dune fan. I read the first book and watched the recent movie, but I'm sure there were some jokes that major Dune fans probably caught that I missed. I think the parody was really successful, though, and there were also some sequences in this episode that looked really cool. I love Frank Welker as the voice of Nibbler. My mind has already degenerated to the point where I can no longer predict the ending of an M. Night Shyamalan movie. He's fantastic, and I'm glad they got him back for this season. But for whatever reason, the episode didn't quite deliver on the emotional weight that it seemed to be going for. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it just felt like it was missing a certain je ne sais quoi. Just a special something that was also missing a little bit from Children of a Lesser Bog. It's not that the episode left me completely unmoved. Nibbler is a great side character, and it's well established how much Leela loves him. And even though the episode didn't make me cry or anything, the ending did still give me the warm and fuzzies. But when compared to the best Nibbler episodes, like The Day the Earth Stood Stupid, You say those awful flying brains are making everyone on Earth stupid? Oh, stupider. The Why of Fry. You really think I would have had a chance with Leela? You must choose the present or the future to save yourself or save Leela. Or Game of Tones. Because this isn't your dream, it's your mother's dream. It feels like part of what's missing is a sense of greater lore that have often come with the Nibblonians in the past, especially in episodes where Nibbler speaks. So your real name is Lord Nibbler? That's a coincidence. That name is for your sake. In the time it would take to pronounce one letter of my true name, a trillion cosmoses would flare into existence and sink into eternal night. I mean, Nibbler was planned to have a role in Fry being frozen from the very first episode, where we see his shadow on the floor in the pilot, and the payoff for that was fantastic and didn't even come in the first season. Ah, oh, Nibbler's there. Wait, what? 
This episode just feels somewhat disconnected from the rest of the lore around the Nablonians and sort of lacks a sense of magnitude. The implications from this episode are interesting, but just aren't really addressed or dealt with at all. A minor nitpick I have is that Nibbler's sudden need of sand from his ancestral pooping grounds doesn't really make sense. Didn't throw out the litter. No, he needs it to live. It's from his ancestral pooping grounds. Especially since we've seen him poo without it before. And I do generally try not to pick apart cartoons the way I would a live action show. But Leela got Nibbler on Virgon 6, not his ancestral planet. So when and where did she get the special sand? And why was he okay without it for so long? It just felt hastily contrived. I know that there had to be a reason that they couldn't just change out the litter. And I'm willing to overlook it for the sake of the episode. It just slightly irked me. I tend to reward shows for planning little things like that in advance and then paying it off rather than simply retconning something for the sake of a single episode. Like, it's fine. It just reminds me of the Star Trek Voyager episode Ashes to Ashes, where a crewman we've never heard of before comes back from the dead and Harry was apparently totally in love with her. What about us? The girl you were in love with died three years ago. Wait a minute! Who are you? But has never mentioned her before or since. Like, these things just stick out to me among other plot points and episodes that are meticulously planned and set up. And it's not that this is the first time Futurama's done something like this, but I'm much more likely to ignore it for an episode like Lethal Inspection, in which Bender is missing a crucial backup unit he's never mentioned before or since, in service of some greater character moments. And I don't know that the character moments were quite enough in this episode for me to really just totally ignore that. That said, I do think it's a little fun that the glitter and various parasites in the box seem to be a reference to Toxoplasmosis that often inhabit cat litter boxes. A lot more likely if you let your cat outside. As a cat owner, there were actually quite a few little litter box jokes that made me chuckle. And overall, this was a good episode, right on the precipice of being a great one. And it is still another step in the right direction for the season. It's the episode I've enjoyed the most so far with the reboot. And I think we're noticing a steady improvement in quality of the episodes as the season is going along. So I'm hoping the writers will be fully back in their groove by the end of the season. Although, then they may have to get into the groove all over again if the studios and streaming services continue to refuse to fairly compensate actors and writers and production continues to be delayed. So that's cool. Support the strikes. Anyways, that is all just my opinion. I would love to hear what you thought about this episode. What were your favorite jokes? Were there any great Dune references that I missed? Let me know in the comments section down below. Like, subscribe, and share for more videos and to help my tiny little channel grow. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Peter Zane.